good evening welcome to webinar on interstitial lung disease jointly organized by the candy society of medicine and sri lanka college of pulmonology you know that interstitial lung disease is a very important group of condition which is very very practically relevant today and it is management is utmost important the diagnosis as well as the proper management are mandatory in the proper outcome as well as limiting the bad consequences as you know that interstitial lung disease is the disease affecting the interstitium there's a very thin layer of tissue lying in between alveoli that particular tissue is very important the function of the respiratory system they are the diffusion take place where the oxygen from the alveoli to capillaries same as the carbon dioxide from capillary to the, uh, the alveoli are taking place through this thin layer of tissue the dysfunction or the problem related to interstitium is badly or functionally affect the physiological status of the human being Uh, this this group of disease is a, uh, this name is interstitial lung disease is an umbrella term or we may use this term as a diffuse parenchymal lung disease or pulmonary fibrosis this umbrella term which include several group of disorder where the, the process is result in inflammatory or fibrotic or both causing the infiltration of the alveolar septa interstitium resulting in effects on the capillary endothelium and alveolar epithelium So William Osler in 1892 described the postmortem specimen of lung. He mentioned record that death occur about three months and half after the onset of acute disease, and the lung was two third of the normal size, grayish in color and hard as cartilage. And microscopically, these areas showed advanced fibrotic changes and great thickening of the alveolar wall. This indirectly showing showing that is a, is a effects of. A, interstitial lung disease what is going to happen to the lung at the end of the 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 the, the, the end of the disease and this particular group of disorder due to many pathological consequences it could be due to acute lung injuries or may due to fibrosis may be due to cellular infiltrate alveolar filling or nodule or granuloma or minimal change but these pathological changes are due to many many different etiological causes as well as a different pathological uh, the hallmarks so there now you understand that you think that it is a although that there are the, the name called common disease interstitial lung disease due to many pathological events which include the six type of uh, the, the pathological consequences over the year there is an evolution of classification 1969 the libo classified into the four five groups later 1992 Catch the steam, classify the further, and later, 2002, in terms of the consensus of the ERS and ATS, further divided this group into several subtypes. Later, over the period, there will be further discussion on the classification of uh, interstitial lung disease. Major, there are two major groups. We are the diffuse lung disease or the interstitial lung disease due to known etiology, something like a sarcoidosis so. Have a sense of humanity, or it could be the unknown or, or idiopathic. There are many conditions which include into these two different groups, but pathologically they are same. Although the etiologically, one some we know the etiology, others we don't know the etiology. But they are given the different nomenclature depending on the known etiology as well as unknown etiology. So it can be broadly classified the known etiology as well as unknown etiology. Later. But with the further, if you see that known etiology, the common disease, what we know due to inorganic substances, organic substances, smoking, connective diseases, and various toxins and drugs. Same way, unknown has several groups. Broadly, this unknown group, or called idiopathic interstitial pneumonia, there's a main pathological cause. Because causes are there, as you know. There's a UIP, the usual interstitial pneumonia, NSIP, DIP, RBILD, LIP, and cryptogenic organized pneumonia, so on. But this broadly divided into idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, that is idiopathic, which is pathologically UIP. The rest called idiopathic interstitial pneumonia, other than idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. But there's another group which is common in the childhood. We call child childhood interstitial lung disease. The different entities. This is the most important group where the interstitial lung disease is concerned, where the the different types. 
later the further divided into the major causes of uh, idiopathic intestinal lung disease and rare causes and unclassified causes. These uh, major causes are mainly the chronic fibrosis in type where you all of us know is uh, IPF and NSIP. These are progressive diseases compared to the smoking related one, these are rare one as well as acute and subacute conditions. So the major group, smoking related, acute and subacute, and the chronic fibrosing are the further the classification by the ATS and ERS in 2002. Now the important aspects of the intracellular lung disease, where the pathologically it could be due to inflammatory or it could be due to fibrotic. For example, CTDILD mainly inflammatory versus IPA mainly to fibrosis. So it's a, it's a different, different behavior of the uh, the one group of conditions. I say so it's, it's a, although under the one umbrella, it's a different entities, different pathological things. And the diagnosis is very important in the interest language. We are the that's the basic clinical medicine, the history, physical examination, detailed lung functioning, chest graphography. We can differentiate the IIPs and the other possible IIPs later the HRCT with biopsies and the further investigation, we can narrow down our specific diagnosis. What is important is to the is a combined effort by a multidisciplinary discussion where the clinician, radiologist, pathologist, and the related specialist finally discussion and come to the, the single diagnosis. Sometimes even that will be very difficult because behavior of the disease are different. What is important now is the, the trajectory and the prognosis will depend on the different pathological type. For example, NSIP has a better prognosis compared to the UIP. We are the concordant UMP has a worse prognosis com compared to the discordant UIP. So the, all the causes of uh, interstitial lung disease, what is important to understand is the final common pathway where the, these patients are finally leading into the common type of complications starting from the hypoxia, hypoxia driven complication, fibrosis and fibrotic related complication and various other complications related to pathophysiological basis of interstitial lung disease. Now the important understanding is that the mortality of disease, I take as example IPF, where mortality is very important in this group of condition. It can happen at any given time, depending on the consequences, exacerbation, as well as various other complications. So the exacerbation in the Intercellular lung disease is very important to recognize. We are the each and every exacerbation, there's a deterioration of lung function leading to the increased morbidity as well as mortality. Today, joint effort by our Society of Candy Society of Medicine, as well as the Sri Lanka College of Pulmonology, we are going to highlight various aspects of interstitial lung disease and starting from the uh, CTD, ILD, hypersensory pneumonitis and the radiology and then later the latest evidence-based management. Hopefully this session will enlighten all our audience to clear their mind and to update their current knowledge uh, of uh, interstitial lung disease. We have invited experts locally as well as overseas to enlighten and support to carry out this session which will be a resource with the, with the rich of resource and half uh, there will be question session at the end of the presentation. And I, I think I am very happy uh, to uh, accept uh, the, the, the Sri Lanka College of Pulmonologists as well as uh, I must thank all the speakers uh, today to accepting our invitation to be here as a resource person. Now I'm inviting Dr. Nandika Harishchandra, President Sri Lanka College of Pulmonologists to start the session with the introduction of the speaker. Okay. Thank you very much, sir, uh, for your wonderful uh, introduction to this uh, webinar on interstitial lung diseases. So, so it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, the first speaker tonight, that is Dr. Amita Fernando. I think he's uh, not a stranger to this audience. He's one of the leading uh, respiratory physicians in the island, and he's uh, one of the postgraduate trainer attached to the uh, National Hospital of Colombo. Uh, he was one of the uh, past presidents of Sri Lanka College of Pulmonologists, and most interestingly, is is one of the local experts in the uh, field of interstitial lung diseases. And in addition, he's an author of many local and international publications as well. So today, he's going to talk about critical presentations of 
connective tissue diseases induce interstitial lung disease. So with my great pleasure, let me uh, invite Dr. Amita Fernando to start his presentation. Over to you. Hello, can you all hear me? Uh, a warm welcome uh, to our friend from overseas, Nandika. Thank you for those kind comments. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I'm uh, due to talk about critical presentations of connective tissue disease in uh, interstitial lung disease. I plan to base my talk on uh, selected few cases. Can the slides be seen? Yes, can everyone see? Uh, thank you. Uh, so acute presentation, presentations of connective tissue ILD may result from ILD related causes like acute interstitial pneumonia or diffuse alveolar damage, which is a pathological hallmark of AIP, uh, vascular complications such as alveolar hemorrhage, diffuse alveolar, uh, diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, thromboembolic complications such as pulmonary embolism, uh, and the consequences of uh, pulmonary embolism, which can lead to chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension and resultant right heart disease. Pneumothoraces in certain uh, interstitial lung diseases are known to occur, uh, and also as a complication of uh, infection like PCJ or pneumocystis gerasi. Immunosuppressive med medications have along with them uh, give rise to infections uh, and one must be aware of these conditions. Uh, drug toxicities also can complicate the picture. Uh, so acute excess, if you talk about exacerbations in connective tissue ILD, uh, it can occur in a pa patient known to have connective tissue lung disease, connective tissue disease, but no previous diagnosis of ILD. It can occur in a patient who, ha who has connective tissue lung disease and already a known ILD. And ILD may be the first and only manifestation of a connective tissue disease. So to begin my in, uh, case, this cases, uh, this is a 40-year-old mother of three, previously well. Uh, 12 months prior to her initial presentation, she complained of morning stiffness, pain and swelling of wrist joints, metacarpopharyngeal joints and interpharyngeal joints. She had oral ulcers which were painful with gum bleeds. She complained of scaly ischy rashes over both hands, increased pigmentation over the front of chest and neck and lateral aspects of the thigh. As, as the pictures illustrate uh, the classic signs of mechanics hand, shawl sign and holster sign. Four months prior to her uh, uh, presentation, she developed generalized, weak, generalized weakness, loss of weight, loss of appetite, uh, and she experienced some difficulty in rising from sitting position. Three months prior uh, to her presentation, when we saw her, uh, she complained of increasing shortness of breath, MMRC2, which progressed over a period of four weeks to MMRC5. These are her HRCT. Uh, I want to clear to you, but what, we like, what I would like to highlight is that uh, there was a very bronchovascular pattern of distribution, patchy areas of peripheral consolidations and bronco, bronco and ground glass changes were all also seen. And it's the, as you see in the individual cuts, there were some plural based arcades. Uh, there were periglobular peri parenchymal changes. And hence, there was no reticulation, traction, honeycombing or mosaics or nodules which you associate with the more progressive form of uh, fibrotic lung disease. So high resolution diagnosis of, uh, of organizing pneumonia was made. Uh, we went on to do, proceeded to do a transbronchial lung biopsy. Actual, actually, um, it is not, indicated, not really necessary in these patients where the clinical features and the radiology it itself is explanatory. But the histological features on this transbronchial lung biopsy was compatible with the cellular NSIP or non-specific interstitial pneumonitis. Uh, subsequent, ENGs showed an uh, inflammatory myopathy. And she had a, uh, the, 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 the violaceous plaques over the DOS or over the metacarpal heads. Uh, in certain instances, some of these plaques are ulcerated, were biopsied, and the histology was compatible with, with that of a Gottron's papule. Uh, so these were the autoimmune profile of these patients. We did a myositis profile, uh, which had a negative PL7 and PL12, a row 52, a marker of interstitial lung disease, uh, was strongly positive. Uh, her anti antisynthetase antibodies, uh, JO1 was negative, ANA was negative, uh, and the, her TRAD synthetase antibodies associated with the associated with antisynthetase syndrome, which includes the PL7, PL12, and the JO1, JO1 commonly known to us, were all negative. Uh, uh, but her CPK was high, 
she had EMG and um, EMG was evidence of myositis and her skin biopsy was compatible with dermatomyositis. Uh, and the, the clinical features were also in favor of that. Uh, so we were unable to do this anti melanoma differentiating anti antibody 5 uh, because Sri Lanka does not have the facilities at the moment to do that test and the patient was unable to send her blood sample overseas for further evaluation of this. But I think uh, going through the history presentation, and the phenotypic features we thought, saw in our patient, we had sufficient evidence uh, to conclude uh, that this was uh, MDA, MDA5 antibody positive uh, dermatomyositis. Her gottron spectrums, there are certain fe phenotypic features which are associated with the gottron spectrums were ulcerative. Uh, she had a Holster sign, and in addition to that, she had erythematous macules over her, her knees. Uh, more than mechanic hands, she had uh, ulcerative lesions and also palmar papules, which has been associated with the more aggressive form of dermatomyositis seen in this patient with MDA5 antibody positivity. Uh, she had gum bleeds and oral ulcers. The MDA5 antibodies or the melanoma differentiating association gene 5 antibodies, formerly known as clinical amyopathic dermatomyositis of 140, uh, is now a well known entity described in Asian populations. I'm sure our speakers from overseas would, like, would also share their experience with this. Uh, more commonly found in Asian populations. Uh, associated with a rapidly progressive interstitial lung disease uh, and uh, needing aggressive immunosuppressive therapy. Some of the features seen uh, phenotypically favor this diagnosis and having an uh, antisynthetase profile of JO1, PL7, and PL12 negative uh, virtually excluded the uh, antisynthetase syndrome in this patient, which was the other main differential diagnosis. So our patient uh, went on to MDG, uh, had IV methyl prednisolone pulses for three days, oral prednisolone, followed by IV immunoglobulins. Uh, mycophenidate was initiated, cotrine prophylaxis with calcium supplementation and proton pump inputs were given. Uh, it is known that dermatomyositis is associated with occult or underlying malignancy, so she underwent a screening, including mammograph, imaging, and uh, auto and, uh, and tumor marker testing, which was negative. In Asian populations, my subsequent return showed that uh, nasopharyngeal carcinomas have been associated with uh, dermatomyositis. Uh, this MDF5 antibody positive dermatomyositis. Below, you see the lung function results after initiation of treatment, and you see the remarkable improvement in her skin manifestation after, uh, after the, the immunoglobulins and the oral steroids. Uh, so, at the moment, she's in follow up and she's doing well. Uh, so, I will not dwell too much on the treatment because we have sub speakers subsequently talking on these subjects. Uh, so, to conclude my first case, uh, we concluded that this was a patient with uh, dermatomyositis, uh, MDA, possibly a MDA5 uh, antibody positive dermatomyositis based on the phenotypes, uh, typic features, and other, and the autoantibody profile. Though we were un unable to do the confirmatory antibody test, uh, we, 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 we were able to conclude that it's a MDA5 antibody positive dermatomyositis. My second patient is a 70 year old female, previously healthy. Short history of fever, cough, progressive shortness of breath, dyspnea, loss of weight and loss of appetite of three months duration. Prior to the initial symptoms, she experienced arthralgia, small and long joint thickness, pain of a period of over two months. She had bilateral ankle swelling, uh, two months uh, of two months duration. There were no other features to suggest any other cystic disease. Uh, her examination was unremarkable for features of connective tissue disease. The only positive findings were based on crepitations. She had absent breath sounds in the her, her light, right lower zone. Um, there was other, no other uh, uh, osteoskeletal and other, in, uh, in other fe clinical features to suggest autoimmune disease. Her blood, her full blood count showed a leukocytosis with a neutrophil leukocytosis. The blood picture showed toxic granules uh, and um, suggestive of infection. Her ESR and CRP were erased. Renal and other profiles were normal apart from uh, changes in her liver, liver enzymes, which showed a, 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 a cholestatic picture which raised gamma GT and uh, alkaline phosphatase. A sputum, uh, for, a co a sputum cultures were negative, COVID was negative. Uh, ultrasound bedside, which is a useful investigation which we use, showed consol uh, at consolidation with pleural thickening and a uh, left-sided mild pleural effusion. Pleural aspirate was that of a transudate with a serum albumin to pleural gradient of more than 1.2 gram per deciliter. These are her, her serial X-rays. Her, her uh, investigation for her infective cause proved to be negative. 
Uh, we also see mediatosis and leptospirosis in Sri Lanka. So whenever see, we see a renal pulmonary syndrome, patient with a renal pulmonary syndrome who ha has unexplained uh, biological changes, suggestive of alveolar hemorrhage, uh, and if the clinical settings also supports this, we call it of, of leptospirosis. You know, Procacidonine was slightly elevated. Uh, she had no previous cardiac history, but her 2 d echo, transverse thick echocardiogram, showed uh, evidence of pulmonary hypertension. She had no evidence of myocarditis. Uh, her cardiac troponins uh, and BNP were negative. Uh, because of poor initial clinical response and raising uh, inflammatory markers, her antibiotics were changed from, from carbapenems, vancomycin. Uh, she needed iron traffic support. Initially, she was on, on high flow nasal oxygen, you know, and then she had went on to CPAP and subsequently she had been intubated. She had a series of CT scans, but I'm going to show a scan that will highlight and relevant to my presentation. So she showed uh, patchy shadowing, brown glass, and alveolar shadowing, which was mainly peribronchovascular in distribution. Mm, uh, there was no uh, features to suggest the dependent distribution, pulmonary edema, which would be our, one of the differential diagnoses. Uh, it was poor or less symmetrical and a little unusual for atypical pneumonia. So our main differential diagnosis in these instances was diffuse alveolar hemorrhage or a bronchovascular distribution of organized pneumonia. So uh, she had to be intubated. And then she went on to uh, have a, a bronchoscopy, which showed hemorrhagic patches in uh, left lingual and basal uh, area without any evidence of uh, serial bleeding. Serial aliquots of uh, aliquots um, didn't show evidence of diffuse alveolar hemorrhage or evidence of alveolar bleeding. Uh, inflammatory markers were negative, except for a positive galactomenon antigen test. A serum galactomenon was also positive. She was not on any medication. Who, that would give rise to a false positive test like the president has uh, This is her autoimmune profile, which showed uh, ANA positivity of 1 in 160, cytoplasmic pattern and homogeneous rheumatoid factor was high, was high of a high theta, 140. ENA panel was negative, CPK was negative, was uh, normal, um, and anticitrin peptide antibodies, anti CCP, was significantly high at 90.9. A uh, theta over uh, 60 is considered as high. So these are, we started on oriconazole, uh, uh, oriconazole 200 BD. She had a bula, bula on her initial exposure. Subsequently went on to develop a right side uh, These are her serial x-rays. Uh, we were able to, we, uh, that we saw. Um, so in her, uh, we, were, we passed her with methylprednisone for five days, uh, a little extended uh, treatment. Uh, was subsequently uh, put on oral prednisone. She was I, given IV immunoglobulin for five days uh, and she had CRP dropped but unfortunately uh, she developed uh, acinobet uh, hospital acquired a nosocomial septicemia involving acinetobacter both the ET cultures and um, and her uh, intercostal tube drainage site were positive and acinetobacter uh, despite in spite of being treated with nebulizer and IV cholesterol uh, she succumbed to her illness so well, what does this case uh, imply uh, is this IPAC or idiopathic interstitial, interstitial pneumonia? Sorry, interstitial pneumonia with autoimmune features. Uh, the three domains that we characterize, we, we um, tend to associate with this. Uh, the clinical clinical domain she had uh, new fatigue, arthralgia, and small and large joint stiffness and pain. Uh, the serological domain she had a positive ANA at a theta of one in sixty. The criteria says three hundred and twenty, but serial dilution sometimes is difficult to do because it it, it means it it would incur additional cost to the patient. Rheumatoid factor was positive in high theaters. Her uh, anti CCP antibodies, as mentioned earlier, was significantly high. Her uh, radiological features or the high resolution CT features, uh, the main differential diagnosis being alveolar hemorrhage and organizing pneumonia. Uh, but we favored organizing pneumonia because there was no uh, bronchos, the bronchial large uh, assessment did not show any evidence of alveolar hemorrhage. There was no hemocellular macrophages, also uh, microscopically. So uh, we see a spectrum of interstitial lung disease uh, in connective tissue diseases, some of the, which you will be dis you will listen when the subject of this can be speak about the radiology of this. So I'm not going to build on that too much. Uh, so what uh, uh, patient is this? Uh, IPAC? Uh, how this how would this condition have behaved? Is it SLE? Uh, not the correct age group. DSDNA, other and mother markers were negative. High treatment of rheumatoid arthritis, anti CC CP. Red fight factor positive, aggressive ILD. Uh, is this a form of rheumatoid arthritis, uh, ILD? 
the common ILD in rheumatoid arthritis, as we know, is UIP, uh, which can have acute exacerbations and acute presentations, a diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, um, acute interstitial, interstitial pneumonitis is known to occur, diffuse alveolar damage, sorry, and uh, acute interstitial pneumonitis is known to occur with rheumatoid arthritis, uh, and diffuse alveolar hemorrhage can occur. Also, rheumatoid vasculitis can be uh, also uh, the patient with rheumatoid arthritis can develop rheumatoid vasculitis. We were considering this that the ball and others, other investigations did not support this. And this is usually in a patient who has long standing rheumatoid arthritis with strongly seropositive and rheumatoid nodules. Um, so, what was the significance of the galactomerin positivity, uh, both in serum and ball? Uh, but the radiology was not in keeping with invasive acidosis. Um, here we know. Uh, that aspergillus is a significant confounder in patients with interstitial lung disease. Uh, and what immune modu modulating options would, do we have and what would, would have been appropriate in this patient? I'm sure uh, this talks on management, we will hear more about this. So the options we had was rituximab, cyclosporin A, tractodimus, cyclohosamide and MMF. Our experience here in Sri Lanka is mostly with cyclohosamide and MMF. Uh, we do use rituximab in patients with uh, rheumatoid arthritis induced interstitial lung disease, uh, but uh, cyclosporin and tachronimus uh, evidence for this and our experience on this are limited. Uh, my third patient, in, in conclusion of this case, uh, we assume that this patient had uh, a form of a rheumatoid uh, connective tissue disease induced uh, lung disease uh, with uh, organizing pneumonia like features. Uh, she had an acute presentation. Uh, and the significance of aspergillus, we were not sure. Um, and it must be remembered that patient with rheumatoid arthritis, UIP or usual interstitial pneumonia, is not alone uh, the cause of exacerbations. Patient and significant exacerbation can occur due to other causes as well. The, the third patient I, I'm going to introduce uh, to illustrate my talk is a 76 year old male with diabetes, hypertension, well controlled, non smoker, unproductive cough, breathless, and on physical activity. Um, just rush through, uh, through the clinical presentation. Uh, sh the, the CT scan showed, showed uh, reticulation, traction bronchiectasis, ground glass changes of basal predominance. There was no honeycombic air trapping or mosaicisms or nodules. Uh, we were in favor of a fibrotic NSIP, and her, his antinuclear factor was positive in theta of 1 in 60 uh, and a homogeneous pattern. ENA was negative, rheumatoid factor was negative. Uh, we started the patient uh, on Pedicillon and IMF. Uh, the patient had a period of clinical stability, but then presented two weeks prior with rapidly progressive symptoms, MRC4 on room air saturation for 80. Uh, he was admitted to hospital. He was evaluated for uh, infections. So CRP was high and progesterone was high, 2.68. And creatinines and other inflammatory markers, D-dimers were negative. CTP done was negative. Uh, there was no evidence of pulmonary hypertension. Uh, his liver enzymes were normal. ANA and the complements were repeated. Uh, this is her subsequent case, which shows diffuse brown glass changes in both places. Uh, and the subsequent HRCT scan showed more brown glass changes associated with, associated with areas of uh, traction in the areas of traction bronchiectasis and uh, fibrosis. So we were, he was treated with uh, broad spectrum antibiotics, cotrimazole, uh, chemiflu. Um, and the patient was you know, had increasing demands of oxygen, pheno, CPAP, and went on to be mechanically ventilated. A medial prednisone pulses were given. Uh, IV immunoglobins we were considering. However, the patient deteriorated rapid, rapidly, and given the age and other uh, the, of being 76 years of age, but he was otherwise healthy. Uh, and we did, we were not we didn't have enough time to proceed with this, and the family was not in favor of escalating treatment. Uh, the bedside ultrasound, as we know, or lung ultrasound is also a very useful tool, diagnosis tool in these situations where differential diagnosis of fluid overload, ARDS, comes to play. What would have been the options we had? Uh, Prone ventilation, hemoperfusion with polybics in the fiber columns, ECMO, would have been some of the options we had. Unfortunately, in Sri Lanka, we should, still do not have a lung transplant program. So after an initial discussion with the family, uh, it was, uh, this, uh, this, uh, it was uh, decided not to escalate treatment. And on day two of day two or three of mechanical ventilation, patients come to his illness. So when we see a patient who presents acutely with a known or suspected connective tissue interstitial lung disease, we go through this algorithm of working. These are the, 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 the 
the differential diagnosis that we have had in mind. The acute exacerbation of the connective tissue ILD. Is this pulmonary embolism, D-dimers, echoes, CTPS? Is this congestive cardiac failure? You must remember, you must keep in mind that coexisting cardiac disease can happen. So your probe BNPs, your echoes, your bedside ultrasounds will help you. Uh, the HRCT to rule out infections and the relevant microbiology. Uh, the the uh, PCJ or pneumocystis gerosis PCV training. CMV, uh, so far we haven't encountered as a significant pathogen or uh, uh, confounder in patients with uh, Patient with ILD who on immunosuppression, we do see such co-infection in patients with uh, post-transplant patients who are on immunosuppression, and of course now COVID-19 will come into our differential diagnosis. Diffuse albumin hemorrhage is very important, and we have discussed some of the aspects of it. Uh, there is no clinical definition of patients of connective tissue uh, diseases related ILD or CTILD. Uh, what we can do is to extrapolate what is a consensus on IPF patients uh, when they come with acute exacerbation. The most six, recent 2016 update says acute clinically significant respiratory deterioration characterized by evidence of new or widespread alveolar abnormality. Uh, and in our experience, seeing this abnormality in relation to the brown lung in, in, in areas of reticulation or interstitial lung disease may also help in the uh, coming to a conclusion. Uh, so, excluding other extrapyramacrimal causes like, like infections. Uh, pleural effusion, pneumothelesis, uh, pulmonary embolism, cardiac failure or fluid overload uh, is also very important. Uh, so these are, uh, so we, uh, we went through the algorithms that uh, in, uh, such patient will go through uh, and, uh, and then there are risk factors for interstitial lung disease in patients with connective tissue related ILDs. Uh, the common one we see are the antisynthetase syndromes, the dermatomyositis, polymyositis, then now the MD, MD um, MDA5 antibody positive dermatomyositis. Uh, the, uh, the SLD patients who can present acutely with the AIP or DAT like picture or diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. Uh, the rheumatoid arthritis, not mostly like a UIP exacerbation, but these are uh, the, some of the patients who are at risk of developing uh, disease, uh, exacerbation of their ILDs. Uh, is there a role for biomarkers? Can what will happen in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis be extrapolated uh, to? Connective tissue ILDs, the KL6, the surfactant proteins, um, do they have a place in connective tissue I ILDs? Uh, there seems to be some evidence, but I was unable to find any conclusive evidence in favor of this. And KL6 and things are not available in Sri Lanka as of now. Uh, what are our treatment options? I'm sure we'll have an interesting discussion on this. We have rituximab, we have acetaprine, taclorimus, uh, cyclophosphamide, cyclosporine, immunoglobulins, and of course, uh, hemoperfusion with polymyxin, polymyxin B. Uh, Hemophilo columns, which is uh, known used in uh, ARDS and other septic conditions, uh, which I feel uh, will help in the cytokine storm associated with the conditions not available in Sri Lanka and our options of lung transplant. So I think I have time. I can go ahead and discuss another case very, very briefly. This is a patient with uh, connective tissue ILD, with, uh, and this patient was 50 year old female with zero positive rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, since the age of 24, well controlled with metric safe for 10 years. Uh, developed joint deformities, as you can see. Uh, these were her initial HRCTs. Uh, she had uh, interstitial lung disease, uh, suggestive of LSIP. Uh, she had pulmonary artery hypertension with a tricuspid pressure gradient of 55. Um, she was treated uh, with cyclophosphamide uh, pulses, three cycles at one stage, and uh, stabilized on MMF, which she, she went on to have for a period of time. Uh, her initial antibody test showed ANA positivity of 1 in 160, and uh, her CNAP anticentrony antibodies were positive, suggesting a, a, a possible diagnosis of OLAP with a limited cutaneous type of systemic sclerosis. These were her current treatment at the time of presentation. Uh, she presented acutely, uh, being more breathless uh, over the period over a period of uh, one month. Uh, due to uh, access, to being difficult to hospital to access during the COVID period, uh, she was not regularly follow up. At this time of presentation, these were her uh, features. She had very high features of anti CCP and uh, rheumatoid factor, anti CCP more than 1000, C3, C levels, C3, and C4 levels were low. C3 levels were low, uh, D dimers was high. And she, she went on to have a CT pulmonary angiogram, which showed evidence of uh, pulmonary embolism. So, pulmonary embolism is an important factor. Uh, that you should should remember always uh, in our patients 
with connective tissue IUD who present acutely. Uh, so you should have a low threshold uh, to diagnose uh, or suspect pulmonary inversion in our patients. So subsequently, uh, she was started on enoxaparin and shifted to warfarin. Uh, she uh, went on, she, and now she's being followed up and screened, and she's due to undergo uh, a screening for antiphospholipid syndrome. Uh, so that concludes my, uh, my cases. i would be happy to take one or two questions as the uh, moderator suggested. Uh, and thank you for your patient listening. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, I think we'll have the questions at the end of the webinar. So, so all the all the audience uh, will I will ask. We we'll, we'll take all the questions at the end of the webinar. I think there will be a lot of questions uh, from your uh, from your presentation because interest, uh, there are a few uh, interesting cases. So let's move to the next speaker. I think Dr. Madhukar will uh, introduce the uh, next speaker, Dr. Asu, Professor Asuma. Yeah, it is my great pleasure and privilege to introduce the Professor Arata Asuma. Uh, he's uh, the Professor of Pulmonary Medicine, the Nippon Medical University, Tokyo, Japan. Uh, Professor Asuma graduated from uh, medical, Nippon Medical School in 1983 and obtained his MD and PhD from the university in 1991, from the same university. He's the principal uh, author in many international publications, including Impulses and Census Style. And currently, he holds a key position in many international organizations, uh, including APSR and ERS. Actually, it is our pleasure and uh, the, the privilege to uh, include Professor Suma in this webinar. And he's going to talk on hypersensitivity to pneumonitis, uh, hypersensitivity pneumonitis to, to update all of us on the current knowledge on this particular illness. Professor Asuma, to you. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Thank you very much for your introduction. Okay. It's uh, a very, uh, it is my great honor uh, to, to talk about uh, today's talk is a uh, hypersensitivity pneumonitis update. Can you see? Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah, today's, uh, this is my co investigator, uh, Professor Miyazaki. He is a professor in uh, Tokyo Medical Dental University. It, uh, one of the experts of the uh, hypersensitivity pneumonitis. As you can see here, uh, the, the chronic hypersensitivity can, can, you, can you see the, my slide? Yes, yes, yeah, you can yeah, see, we the can see. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, chronic hypersensitivity is a very large part of uh, chronic uh, interstitial lung disease compared with the idiopathic form and the CTDILD sarcoid. So, can you see? Left inside is uh, idiopathic form with uh, IPF. But on right inside is a chronic hypersensitivity, very similar to uh, can it discriminate and the uh, morphological form. It's very difficult to identify the etiology. In some uh, publication is 43% uh, uh, of uh, IPF is a uh, investigator, uh, the identified uh, antigen, uh, chronic hypersensitivity, and uh, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, and occult avian antigen, and uh, sometimes uh, uh, you can use uh, uh, feather bedding. And this is very important for discriminate of uh, etiologically uh, identification. So I like to talk about the uh, four items, uh, pathologic and the disease, uh, classification, uh, diagnosis, and treatment of 
uh, uh, hypersensitivity neuronitis. This is a very beautiful picture of publication that's a uh, uh, vas, vas cover. Uh, environmental factor, the uh, antigen, and also genetic factor as uh, host and uh, host factors. And uh, uh, recently, uh, many investigation is uh, revealed that the uh, immune response, particularly in innate immunity, and going on, the uh, finally of a fibrotic process, a uh, chronic hypersensitivity. And this is very similar to uh, idiopathic interstitial uh, pulmonary fibrosis. Yes. Genetic factor is uh, many a publication is uh, HLA typing and uh, uh, proteasome and the mucine, uh, polymorphous, telomere, our lengths, and so on. Uh, just publication as uh, many things of uh, environmental and the genetic factor is uh, involved in the proceeding of the hypersensitivity pneumonitis. The very uh, recent uh, Prognostic factor is uh, interested in uh, uh, MAC5B promoter polymorphies is uh, very uh, topics uh, of uh, one of the prognostic factors. And the shortening of telomere lengths is also a uh, very important thing. So uh, usual interstitial pneumonia type, uh, this is a very bad prognosis phenotype. Uh, so, uh, force body capacity is a cell gate marker as the prognosis, hypersensitivity, and also uh, idiopathic interstitial uh, primary fibrosis. So, some of the uh, hypersensitivity neuritis is a uh, uh, improved non-fibrotic type and the fibrotic type is a decline of host body capacity and the visible honeycombing is a very bad uh, prognosis. And this is a very similar to uh, uh, idiopathic primary fibrosis. The recent publication is uh, cerebri published in the cellular type and the hypersensitivity is a very good prognosis. And the fibrotic type of hyper, uh, hypersensitivity is uh, relatively poor, but a honeycombing, a visible honeycombing is a very extremely poor prognosis compared with the uh, 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 IPF. This is a very uh, surrogate uh, morphological marker of a prognosis, I think. Exposure is a very important thing. Uh, uh, bad related antigen and also a fungus is very important things, uh, inducer of a primary uh, hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Antigen is also uh, the fungus uh, yeast is a very variable uh, farmer's lung is a very famous, historically very important thing. Uh, uh, mycobacterial hot tub lung is a very uh, non tuberculous uh, mycobacteria is a very important to, in, uh, to inducing the uh, hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Animal protein is also pigeon breeders lung uh, is a very hot topics of uh, uh, antigen inducing the hypersensitivity. In our country, uh, Japan is a somewhat acute type of hypersensitivity. Pneumonitis is a summer type, is a 
large part of the uh, proportion. And farmer's lung is uh, relatively small. And also uh, ventilation uh, induced pneumonitis uh, by the fi financial uh, lung is uh, very small in acute type. However, the chronic type, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, is a bad related, is a very large part of uh, uh, hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Very similar to uh, IPF, UIP. Uh, some of the uh, second uh, inducer is a uh, summer type, the home related. Uh, this is a shower and uh, cleaner uh, is a very uh, popular machine of, uh, uh, in Japan, uh, environmental factors. How uh, it may be uh, different in the, in, depend on the country and the country is a very uh, a different situation. So our acute type is an inflammatory uh, cellular type. And, uh, and also fibrotic type is a promotion uh, of a, a, a collagen vascular uh, collagen production, fiber prolifer uh, proliferation, and the particularly uh, upper area of the lung. This is a, a little bit different of the UI, IPF UIP. And the immunological um, biomarker is a very famous um, TH1 chemokine, the IP10 is a significantly dominant in the NSIP type, acute type, but a chronic UIB type is a TAC, a TH2 chemokine is a predominant. This is one of the candidates of a, a biomarker, a blood check, as a, a very uh, future uh, development of the chronic or acute phase. Uh, very important things. Uh, disease classification is a very classically acute and subacute chronic. This is a, a clinical feature of a, cr a classical classification. But the subacute type is a very difficult to identify. The rewandling, the smoldering, and sometimes a acute phase and sometimes a chronic phase. So a recently a recommendation is a very uh, clinical radio pathological MDD, multidisciplinary discussion is very important things. As a, uh, this is a, not only idiopathic form, uh, hypersensitive pneumonitis is a recommendation discussion. Acute type of a hypersensitivity is a uh, inflammation is predominant, but a chronic type is a uh, combined and widely and the inflammation and the fibrotic. Uh, this is a typical face uh, picture of a UIP pattern. Very widely a chronic, of a, a chronic type of a hypersensitivity neuritis. So chronic non-fibrotic hypersensitivity is a reticulation, is a, um, main, a smoldering reticulation, but a chronic fibrotic type is a development of the uh, cystic lesion is uh, similar to a uh, uh, early phase of IPF UIP. So, Diagnostic criteria in Japan is a very uh, multiple dom domain. As one of the two is uh, immunological findings, uh, provocation test and the environmental uh, inducing inducer and the specific antibody measurement is a, uh, immunological findings. And three and four is a pathologically, radiologically 
identification of fibrosis without, without granuloma uh, by the uh, uh, TBLB or sometimes uh, a surgical lung biopsy. And the reticulation, a reticular shadow, traction bronchiectasis, and honeycombing is a radiological, the very important uh, uh, marker and the prognosis. The progressive deterioration, uh, this is a, a behavior of a clinical situation, restrictive uh, impairment of pulmonary function uh, over one year or two years. Respiratory symptom development is a, a very poor prognostic. This is a, a behavior or a time scale uh, clinical feature. Uh, this, uh, these are uh, three domain is a very important uh, things to uh, 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 and the exposure is also yes. the recent publication as you can see here the uh, uh, exposure and the radiological flow chart of uh, exposure yes or no uh, HLCD yes or no uh, this is a very uh, important things, but uh, immunological uh, finding is, is not, uh, is absent in this criteria. Radiological, pathological findings and morphological, including uh, flow chart is uh, one of the recommendation. But the third one and the, uh, immunological findings is a very, uh, additionally important uh, to identify the idiopathic uh, you know, uh, hypersensitive to pneumonitis uh, discriminate from the idiopathic form. Specific antibody uh, BART antigen is uh, uh, in Japan has identified uh, uh, acute phase is a uh, sensitivity and the specificity is a uh, very high, but a chronic type is a very uh, relatively low sensitivity, but a uh, uh, specificity is a uh, relatively high compared with the sensitivity. Treatment. So uh, antigen avoidance, is a very important thing, a uh, recommendation to the patient. So uh, half of them, antigen avoidance is a very improved, maintain the uh, function. The cumulative uh, survival is a very, a, a very important thing. Uh, so the clinician needs to identify the uh, antigen is a very important thing. Corticosteroid and, and antigen uh, avoidance is a very important, but uh, corticosteroid is survival is, is not beneficial. A large hypersensitivity in pneumonitis cohort. So uh, this is including acute phase and uh, uh, some chronic phase is a very combined time is a very difficulty as a prognostic identification. So uh, coming back to uh, diagnosis, very important, uh, chronic progression or acute, phase, uh, acute type of a hypersensitivity is a very important diagnostic procedure. This publication is uh, immunosuppressive therapy as a recommendation. Uh, some of them, uh, one and, uh, model one and the prospective study is a very uh, successful uh, immunosuppressive therapy for chronic hypersensitivity as a very uh, successful result. 
and uh, anti-inflammatory and uh, mycophenolate is a decline of uh, DLCO is a uh, improve. Uh, this is a uh, recommendation of the mycophenolate and the uh, other cyclin. Uh, this is a, a background of high, chronic hypersensitivity is a very uh, comparable uh, uh, for other uh, popu uh, other publication. Uh, very difficult, and in the future problem is a uh, first type of chronic hypersensitivity is uh, beneficial for the chronic uh, MMF and other cyprine. Finally, uh, recently a uh, publication is an internalip for the progressive fibrosing and interstitial lung disease. Uh, this is a uh, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, a uh, chronic type is uh, one fourth. Uh, and also uh, autoimmune disease and idiopathic interstitial pneumonia and crash fibro. The, uh, this uh, study is excluded uh, the IPF, UIP. So a hypersensitivity pneumonitis is a uh, immune response, uh, immune responsive uh, chronic hypersensitivity progressive type. The main result is a uh, decline of host body capacity as an inhibited by the internalib. Uh, this is very uh, promising data. Uh, all gather uh, progressive form of uh, fibrosis is a very successful result, including hypersensitive tumoritis. Oh. In summary, uh, in my talk is that some un uh, genetic factor is associated with the development of fibrotic existing hypersensitivity patient, particularly interest in the uh, telomere length and the uh, mac 5 b uh, is a, a candidate of a prognostic factor. The chronic Pathogenesis of chronic and fibrotic uh, hypersensitivity is still unclear compared with the idiopathic uh, primary fibrosis. A compatible clinical feature and the pathological feature and the exposure, uh, particularly exposure identification is very important for the uh, diagnosis of uh, hypersensitivity neuritis. Inflammatory and fib uh, fibrotic marker, other than lymphocyte and VL and uh, HLCD findings, is very future uh, problem. Uh, uh, research question is very important, uh, still important things. Choose uh, management, uh, uh, drug choosing as an uh, anti inflammatory or a fibrotic, anti-fibrotic anti collective is very uh, important for the uh, uh, hypersensitive genomitis. Acute phase is, uh, uh, of course, an anti-inflammatory uh, agent, but also uh, a chronic type in the progressive fibrosis, a restriction of the function is a very candidate of um, Mycophenolate or uh, antifibrotic nitinative is very important things. So, uh, future investigation will be needed. Uh, finally, uh, this is uh, uh, my uh, last uh, slide for the presentation. Thank you for, my, uh, for your listening. Uh, uh, Thank you very much. Professor Asuma, thank you very much for very comprehensive evidence-based approach to the management of hypersensitive pneumonitis with the current knowledge. 
I, I think that we will have a question at the end of the presentation and the audience, uh, the, uh, our listeners can send their question in the question and answer tab in your desktop. Now we will move into the, the next presentation. I mean, I think Dr. Nandi Garishan that will introduce the, the next speaker. Yes, uh, I think uh, radiology, uh, especially this uh, chest X-rays and HRCT plays a pivotal role in the diagnosis and management of uh, interstitial lung diseases. So good radiologist input is always necessary and is very helpful as a respiratory physician in, uh, in diagnosis of interstitial lung diseases. So because of that, we have incorporated a well-known uh, radiologist for this uh, webinar as well, Dr. Bhavan Chankarya from India, and he's going to talk about radiology of interstitial lung diseases. Dr. Jankaria is, an, is a consultant radiologist uh, attached to the picture. This by Jankaria Medical Center, Mumbai, India. And he graduated from Mumbai University in uh, 1987 and obtained his MD in radiology from the same university in 1991. He was a past editor in chief of the Indian Journal of Radiology and Imaging, and he's the current president of the Indian Musculoskeletal Oncology Society. So without taking much time, let me uh, uh, invite Dr. Jankaria to present his uh, presentation. So um, thank you, Dr. Nandika Harish Chandra. I can see Dr. Dushant uh, Madhikara is there as well. Uh, Dr. Damit Nandeva, who's been communicating with me. Um, I will spend the next about 20, 25 minutes uh, talking about uh, the radiology. And I hope all of you can hear me and uh, see my screen. Um, so the plan would be to talk about the protocol for scanning. Um, then touch upon fibrosing ILDs, non-fibrosing ILDs, cystic lung diseases, and I will just run through a flow chart that would help with this. Um, let's start with this statement that a good quality study is an absolute must. And this is the protocol that both the Fleischner Society and ATS ERS have come up with and that we have been following, in fact, for many, many years, close to almost a couple of decades, where we need an inspiratory volume scan reconstructed 1 mm at 0.5 mm intervals, um, an expiratory scan. In all patients now, at the first instance, we do a prone inspiratory volume scan as well. Ideally, there should be soft copy images so that they can uh, other people can see them. And if we are giving only films, then they have to be 12 images on a single film. Um, what is a volume scan? Because this is something a lot of um, pulmonologists would ask me. And a volume scan is where you have the entire volume from the apex to the base that we scroll through on our workstations and not just axial, we have the coronal images and we also have the sagittal images to help us with this. And very often we put the axial coronal and sagittal images together. We can go back and forth. We can look at them. So you can see the entire volume of the lungs when we need to um, come to a specific diagnosis. Volume inspiratory images are also required if we're doing automated texture analysis, as in this patient with fibrotic HP, where we get a sense of what is the extent of involvement. And paired inspiratory, expiratory images help with functional analysis in patients who have emphysema and other forms of small airways disease, as we see here. So this is only to say that every patient who comes in for diffuse lung diseases must get supine volume inspiratory, expiratory and prone inspiratory volume scans done. Now, when it comes to diagnosing ILDs, we basically need to broadly differentiate non-fibrotic from fibrotic ILDs. And to do that, we look at the signs of a fibrotic ILD, which would be honeycombing. Honeycombing is cysts uh, with shared walls that are stacked one upon the other and start subplurally. Traction bronchiectasis, which I will discuss in detail. And prior to that, just reticular opacities, which represent intralobular interstitial thickening. 
these are the signs of a non-fibrotic ILD and there are five of them. We have ground glass, which is increased opacity that doesn't obscure the underlying vessels. Consolidation, which is increased opacity that obscures the underlying vessels. Septal thickening, which is thickening of the interlobular septa, which can be with, with fluids, cells, etc. Ill-defined bronchocentric nodules discrete nodules and then cystic lung disease is a separate entity that we will talk about later. So three signs of a fibrotic ILD, five signs of a non-fibrotic ILD. Of course, you can have combinations of the two and then cystic lung disease. Now, once we have differentiated non-fibrotic from fibrotic, the next question really is, if it is fibrotic, is it IPF or is it non-IPF? Now, Traction bronchiectasis defines a fibrosing ILD. So traction bronchiectasis can be distal as we see here. Some people use the term bronchiolectasis. Um, and when it happens, it tells us that there is surrounding fibrosis, which is responsible for the dilatation of the bronchioles, if you put it very simplistically. Uh, this is a patient who has a UIP pattern, and you can see the, the traction bronchiolectasis. This is a patient with a fibrosing organizing pneumonia as a sequel, and you can see the proximal traction bronchiectasis as well. And once we've decided that there is a fibrosing ILD based on the presence of, let's say, traction bronchiectasis, reticular opacities, etc., and you can see that reticular opacities and traction bronchiectasis occur in all these buckets, then we have to decide which bucket it fits into. And broadly, really, it's IPF or non-IPF. And I'll come back to this as we move along. So the first idea is to figure out whether it's IPF or not. And if you see here, the new classification that came out in 2018, divided the UIP pattern into two types, the typical or the probable. And the two are only separated by the presence or absence of honeycombing. So the standard definition that is now almost 15 years old remains the same. That is reticular opacity, subplural basal predominance, as you see here, nothing else. But if you have honeycombing, then it becomes the typical UIP. And then this other patient who also has reticular opacities with subplural basal predominance does not have honeycombing. So it becomes probable UIP. A better way to understand is to just say that this is UIP without honeycombing, which is how it all started. So Gruden and his colleagues who first defined this term about eight or nine years ago, used the term UIP without honeycombing and which actually makes much more sense than saying probable UIP because as an adjective that can create a lot of trouble. But nevertheless, reticular opacities, traction bronchiectasis, subplural basal predominance, and nothing else, no ground glass, nodules, air trapping, defines your UIP pattern. If there is honeycombing, it's typical. If there is no honeycombing, we call it probable. Then comes the question of is it IPF or not? Now, here is a 27-year-old with a UIP pattern, but she has esophageal dilatation and she's 27 years old and she had scleroderma. So this is not IPF. This is scleroderma ILD with a UIP pattern. This is a 66-year-old man smoker who has a UIP pattern, but also has pleural plaques and calcification from asbestos exposure. So this is not IPF. This is asbestos ILD with a UIP pattern. So basically, once we have a UIP pattern, we look for an etiology. If we find one, then it is that etiology related UIP pattern. If we don't find an etiology, then it becomes IPF. So another way of summarizing it is here, subplural basal predominance, nothing else is UIP pattern. No etiology is IPF. So then that brings us to the last bucket or that bucket which is on the right hand side, which is consistent with non-IPF or alternate diagnosis. And let's just see this with an example. This is a 46 year old lady with dyspnea, gradually progressive over five years. We can see honeycombing here on the right side. 
So we could say, okay, subplural basal predominance honeycombing is this UIP and IPF. But let's see what else we are seeing. We see ground glass. We see some air trapping and lucent areas, some normal areas as well. And we could call this the triple density sign. I'll come back to that later. We have an axial distribution pattern going from the hilum to the periphery. We have some ill-defined centrilobular nodules. So we have a lot of additional findings, right? It's not just a plural basal predominance. There is axial distribution, there's no zonal predominance, there's ground glass nodules, et cetera, et cetera. So this becomes the non-IPF or alternative diagnosis. And typically, uh, when we see something like this, 90% of the times a non-IPF diagnosis will either be fibrotic HP or chronic sarcoid. And then there are other less common findings that patient was fibrotic HP. Now here is a 57 year old with dyspnea, gradually progressive over 10 years. You'll also realize that most of the non-IPFs have a very different history profile from IPF as well. And uh, that is something that we just heard in the previous lecture as well. Now here we have fibrosis, a lot of traction bronchiectasis, but axial distribution and upper and mid zone predominance. So this could be fibrotic HP, but we thought this was chronic sarcoid from the distribution. The patient actually underwent a transbronchial biopsy and they found some non-caseating granuloma. So we had our diagnosis of chronic sarcoid here as well. So that's that bucket here, where apart from these findings of a fibrosing ILD, we see other findings or atypical distribution, et cetera. And so that becomes non-IPF, usually HP or sarcoid. And these patients may need a surgical lung biopsy. Dr. Azuma did mention this paper that came out, but it's important to understand this, that you know, we spend often a lot of time trying to differentiate IPF from non-IPF. How important is this? And the inbuilt trial showed that irrespective of the type of fibrosing ILD, as long as it was progressive fibrosing ILD, nintedanib showed a reduction in the rate of progression of FBC. Toby Mayer's group also did a similar thing with perfenidone, though it was not a very, very good study. And they've done this with scleroderma ILD as well in the census trial. So it may be okay in some instances of a progressive fibrosing ILD if you're not able to differentiate IPF from non-IPF, at least as far as antifibrotic treatment is concerned. What about indeterminate for UIP? So indeterminate for us is when it's truly indeterminate, when we shrug our shoulders, when we don't know what's going on, as in the 61-year-old who has these reticular opacities in the right lower lobe. As you go further down, you see more reticular opacities that are asymmetric. There's some traction bronchiolectasis. And we really didn't know what we were dealing with. Is this a UIP IPF? Is this something else? Is this HP? So this patient underwent a surgical lung biopsy or a, a, a VATS guided biopsy because when you don't know, you need a biopsy. And it showed HP. The patient was treated. And you can see nine months later, while there is some residual fibrosis and traction bronchiectasis, a large part of the disease has resolved, right? So this is how it helps. Let's look at this patient, 62-year-old lady, no etiology, no CTD, non-smoker, and we see these subtle reticular opacities also seen in the prone image, and you can see them on the sagittal image. What is this? What do we do with this? Now, if the patient is asymptomatic, has abnormal PFTs, then I would say, I don't know what's going on in a 62 year old. It's indeterminate. If this was 82 year old patient, we might have said this is an early UI or a mild UIP IPF or something like that. In a 60, 50 year old, we don't know what's going on. We would say indeterminate. But if the patient is asymptomatic and this is an incidental finding, then we use the term interstitial lung abnormality or ILA. So I thought I would introduce this topic. There's been a guideline paper that came out about a month, a month and a half ago. And Dr. Hatabu has done a lot of work on this. Typically around 5% or so of the lung is involved. 
it is an incidental finding most of the time. Some people say it is associated with reduced survival. And while this is a position paper, the guidelines still aren't very strong enough because we don't have a lot of good data on what to do with these patients. Lastly, with fibrosing ILDs, let's look at the concept of reverse UIP IPF. Um, so here we have a patient who has what looks like UIP, except that it's in the upper lobes. So you have upper lobes, subplural predominant reticular opacities with volume loss. It could be symmetric or asymmetric. And this is very typical of pleuroparenchymal fibroelastosis or PPFE, which can be primary um, or idiopathic and can be secondary to, you know, chemotherapeutic drugs, uh, connective tissue diseases. It can occur coexistent with IPF or may occur following allograft stem cell transplantation. So we are just publishing a series of about 12 patients that we've seen uh, proven either clinically or on biopsy in the last five years. And uh, while we initially used to think PPFE is uncommon, once we started understanding the disease, we found that it is not. Obviously, in a country like India, and I assume it's true of Sri Lanka as well, you would in all of these patients have to rule out tuberculosis before labeling these patients as PPFE. So these are the four buckets of a fibrosing ILD. That is our aim, that we need to differentiate between IPF and non-IPF, and some patients would turn out to be indeterminate. So what about NSIP? NSIP can be both fibrosing and non-fibrosing. It, it is usually seen with connective tissue diseases. It may precede a full-blown CTD by a few years, but idiopathic NSIP is extremely rare. So there is a tendency to call diseases NSIP when we don't know what's going on. So that's indeterminate. That's not NSIP. NSIP is a defined condition, and we rarely make a diagnosis of idiopathic NSIP anymore. Typically, the patients would have connective tissue diseases or may have some immune changes, in which case you might use the term IPAF, but then that is actually a research term and not a clinical term. So this is the NSIP pattern. We see some subplural sparing, bilateral um, symmetric lesions, usually lower lobe predominant, and there may be an axial predominance with both reticular opacities and ground glass. Here is another patient who has Raynaud's, who has very, very subtle reticular mm -hmm. opacities, which are also seen on the prone images. And this is an early or a subtle mild NSIP presenting in a patient who eventually had a Crest syndrome. What about post-COVID changes? And my title slide here was post-COVID fibrosis, but I've changed it from our experience that we've now had. So we are now seeing patients who have four and five, four months follow-up because the patients from April are now coming in. So this is a patient who we saw yesterday who was positive, I think, on the 16th of May. And in June, after being hospitalized, he came for a, for a scan and you can see all these reticular opacities and ground glass. We said this is likely fibrosis, but we now know that we actually don't know what this is. These are just residual changes. But then he came back yesterday and what was worrying was that the pattern had changed. And I'm going to put the two together here. A lot of these band-like opacities had gone all these so-called areas that could have represented fibrosis have gone and have been replaced by ground glass. But more worrisome are these areas that were spared now show ground glass. And in fact, areas here in the subplural area, which were normal and black and unaffected are now affected. What does this mean? Is this residue? Is this fibrosis? Will this patient eventually have honeycombing traction bronchiectasis volume loss? Is this slowly regressing disease? We know now that it is a vascular disease. So are these some manifestations of an unusual vascular process? We don't know. These are all questions that need to be eventually answered. So let's move on to non-fibrosing ILDs. Ground glass, we've already defined that as one of the commonest signs of a non-fibrosing ILD. Very, very non-specific. If we just see ground glass like this, it means nothing. We need a history to make a diagnosis. 
So sub, let's say it's a four, five month history, non-smoker, exposed to pigeons, we would say hypersensitivity, pneumonitis, the same uh, appearance in a ever smoker would be DIP or severe RBILD. The patient presents acutely, it could be AIP. And if the patient is HIV positive, the, the, positive, the same appearance would be PCP, PJP pneumonia. But ground glass can occur with other findings. So if you have ground glass with air trapping, um, and in this case, we're seeing ground glass, we're seeing lucent areas due to air trapping, and we're seeing some normal spared areas. So these are three densities in one, now called the triple density sign, earlier called the head cheese sign, which is actually from multiple pieces or different types of meat that are put together. And this was very confusing. So Barnett and his colleagues came out with this. They found a very high specificity, obviously not very sensitive. And in the new guidelines that have come out for HP about uh, on 1st of August, uh, this has now been relabeled as the triple density site. Then we have ground glass and consolidation. So when we have the two things together, that's the organizing pneumonia pattern. Uh, you get peribronchovascular opacities or sometimes it's subpleural basal. Sometimes you get this atoll sign where you have ground glass in the center and consolidation at the periphery. Um, or you can have bilateral peripheral like this. But again, here you see ground glass in the center, consolidation at the periphery. This is also called the reverse bat swings appearance when you see it on x-rays. It has been described with eosinophilic pneumonias, but what are eosinophilic pneumonias? They are eventually organizing pneumonias with a high eosinophil count. And so they are the same spectrum of disease radiologically. And now, of course, with COVID, we're seeing these organizing pneumonia patterns of all sorts. Here you have subpleural basal, here you have peribronchovascular, here you have a combination, etc. Then we have ground glass plus septal thickening. So we have ground glass and we have this diffuse septal thickening. And this has been called the crazy paving pattern of alveolar proteinosis, which again can be primary or secondary autoimmune or not, etc. But now we're seeing the crazy paving pattern patchily in COVID-19 patients as well. This is a little different from alveolar proteinosis, but nevertheless, you see a combination of ground glass and septal thickening. We have a new category of patterns now that has come up with COVID-19 because COVID is a perivascular disease. It's not a pneumonia in the true sense. It's a perivascular disease process. And so in an asymptomatic patient here who got a CT done because she could afford it and wanted a CT, you see this earliest sign of a vessel with surrounding ground glass. And this is the perivascular edema that occurs from transudation of fluid. And you can see a very subtle lesion here as well, but it is all around the vessel. This is perivascular. And in slightly more advanced cases, we will see proximal dilated or intralesional dilated vessels. These were described by Lang first, but we see it pretty much on a daily basis. Patel and his colleagues from the Brompton described the vascular tree in bud in sick patients, but in the UK, they only do CT scans in sick patients. We have seen the vascular tree in bud. So here you see the vessel, and then you see the tree in bud of vessel, rather not the bronchial tree in bud of TB. Um, but we are seeing this in asymptomatic patients as well. Again, because this is a perivascular disease. Then we have the target sign, where you have the vessel in the center, then you have the perivascular edema, you have relatively spared lung, and then you have this halo of organizing pneumonia. But all of this is related to vascular change. This is all new stuff, stuff that we didn't know earlier. Even the vasculitic conditions did not come up with these findings, which is learning an entire new set of uh, disease patterns with COVID. We move on to septal thickening, uh, which we see here. If you see only diffuse septal thickening, like we see here with some perihylar ground glass that occurs with pulmonary edema, you can see the bilateral pleural effusions. And this is the first time we've seen pleural effusion today 
in the last 25 minutes, uh, pleural effusions and ILDs don't go hand in hand. And diuretics were given and the patient became fine. Here we have unilateral uh, septal thickening along with this mass. So this is basically lymphangitis. Nodules can be ill-defined centrilobular. And I've blown this up here. This is very typical of non-fibrotic HP. We get discrete nodules. Here we see perivascular, subpleural, and fissural. This is typical of sarcoid. Um, if we look at coronal uh, images, we can see the fissural nodules much better. And then we have these other discrete nodules to look at for as differential. So two to three millimeter size nodules randomly distributed would be miliary. This is the bronchial drain bud, which occurs in TB. And we see nodules of differing sizes with lymph nodes showing eggshell calcification and silicosis. So we came up with this um, pattern here. Um, or this chart, if you have ill-defined diffuse, it's HP, and these are all the discrete nodules. So the last two or three minutes, this is cystic lung disease. If you have a woman in the, reproduce, um, in the reproductive age group, without, um, with the intervening lung being normal, then that's usually lymphangiomyomatosis, uh, histologe, I mean, um, you can you can confirm this by doing the serum uh, VGF levels, uh, and they would be sky high. Today, we have treatment options for these patients uh, as well. If you have a man, woman who's a smoker, then it's PLCH. Or put it the other way around, we don't diagnose PLCH in non-smokers unless the patient has a histiocytic syndrome um, uh, like Erdheim chest uh, or uh, sinus histiocytosis, uh, et cetera. Or uh, it could be uh, uh, Langerhans cell histiocytosis, which is widespread or multifocal, et cetera. Then you may get it without in non-smokers. But otherwise, PLCH occurs only in smokers. BHT or Berthog dube syndrome is not uncommon. It can occur in, man, in, in men or women. Typically, you have the folliculin gene that's positive. And you see cysts which are lenticular shaped, larger in the lower lobes. And often you see these vessels as, as if they're going through the cyst. And once we started understanding this disease, we see about one case every two or three months now. And the intervening lung is invariably normal. The fourth condition is LIP, which typically occurs in Sjogren's, other connective tissue diseases, or in HIV positive patients. And we see these perivascular cysts along with some interstitial lung disease as well, which can be quite variable. And even here, we do not make a diagnosis of LIP unless the patient has Sjogren, other connective tissue diseases, or is HIV positive. So, quickly, the flow chart here. When we see diffuse lung disease, if we see only ground glass nodules, mosaic septal thickening, and now, of course, these perivascular lesions, then it's a non-fibrosing ILD, and we diagnose depending upon the pattern. If we see traction bronchiectasis, reticular opacities, then it's a fibrosing ILD. If there is nothing else, no ground glass nodules, etc., as you see on the left, um, then it's the UIP IPF pattern. Typical UIP if there's honeycombing, probable UIP if there's no honeycombing. And if there's no etiology and the correct age, 70 plus, that's IPF. But if there are other etiologies, then it is that etiology related UIP pattern. And if in the setting of a fibrosing ILD, we have altered distribution, other findings, then it's a non IPF pattern, which occurs with either fibrotic HP or chronic. Sarcoid. I'm sorry to plug my book here, but there is a Kindle edition available in case you would like it. I'm sorry for this. And uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, Dr. Shankaria, for your wonderful and comprehensive talk on radiology of interstitial lung diseases. I'm sure there will be a lot of questions from the audience at the end. Uh, so let's move to the next speaker, and Dr. Mayadagadra will introduce the next yeah. speaker. It is my the great pleasure and the privilege to introduce our the fourth speaker uh, from the United Kingdom, uh, Dr. Nasia Chaudhry from the United Kingdom. She is going to talk about the current management of uh, the interstitial lung disease. Dr. Chaudhry is uh, the consultant respiratory physician uh, and the clinical lead for the ILD service at the Manchester University NHS Foundation uh, Trust UK. She's an honorary senior lecturer at the University of Manchester. Uh, 
She graduated from the University of Leeds with an honor degree in medicine and a BSc honors in genetics. She performed a PhD and published her work looking at the cellular interaction and signaling in response to infection and air pollution. She's a principal investigator on a number of clinical research trial in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and is the UK chief investigator of a major clinical trial on progressive interstitial lung disease. She's a member of British Thoracic Society, Lung Registry Steering Group for the BTS Sakoi and IPF Registry. It is, it is my pleasure to invite Dr. Chowdhury to present her lecture. Dr. Chowdhury. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your kind introduction. Um, I'd like to thank the organisers for inviting me today, and particularly Dr Sadakin, who I had uh, the pleasure to work with whilst he was in the UK. So I'm going to, in the next 20 to 30 minutes, just highlight some of the current evidence in the management of interstitial lung diseases. And you've seen some of these trials already as well, shared by uh, my esteemed colleagues. So these are my disclosures. So what I'm hoping to cover in the next 20 to 30 minutes is I will just set the scene by again, just showing you the summary of ILD classification as a quick reminder to help then lead on to me um, presenting some case-based illustrations to cover the evidence base for treatments covering idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Um, I am going to talk about the UK NICE quality standards um, um, and try and for us not to forget the non-pharmacological management of IPF and the evidence surrounding pulmonary rehab and ambulatory oxygen. I will touch on systemic sclerosis and the um, evidence behind mycophenolate, cyclophosphamide and antifibrotics, and then already presented briefly already progressive interstitial lung disease um, and the role of antifibrotics. So this is just a, a reminder again for you, um, you've seen this before, um, the classification of interstitial lung disease, just remembering that the unknown causes, the idiopathic interstitial pneumonias of which idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is the most common, but there are other idiopathic causes such as NSIP. And then obviously the known causes that we've already heard about today, connective tissue diseases, uh, chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, and then other exposures such as drugs, and then not forgetting the rarer causes and sarcoid as well. And when we think about ILDs, we can be really, really um, simplistic and think about those that are predominantly fibrotic and those that are predominantly inflammatory to try and help us think of the treatment options. And obviously idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis being the predominantly archetypal fibrotic lung disease. And then everything else really um, is a predominantly inflammatory condition to start off with. Uh, but over time, they can progress and have this overlap of inflammation and fibrosis, which then allows us to think about the future of ILD treatment where we have combinations of therapies with immune suppressants and fibrotic um, antifibrotics as well. So just to just reiterate the point how important clinical assessment is um, with that array of uh, potential diagnoses, don't forget to um, assess your patients to identify a known cause because that's really key in the management. So don't forget to think about the symptoms of connected to disease, which we've just heard about with the swollen joints, the mouth ulcers, the rashes thinking about environmental exposures to birds, mold and uh, pigeons and the list of causes of chronic HP get bigger and bigger every day. And then I really like this website um, by one of our French colleagues, pneumatox.org, that you should put every drug into so that you can double check that there's no association with interstitial lung diseases. And then obviously the soft signs of connective tissue disease to help us think of known causes of ILD. And then just summarizing the investigations uh, with the serology, with the autoimmune screen, the myositis panel, ANCA, looking for vasculitis, the precipitants and ACE in sarcoid, and not forgetting the great talk that we've just had on, on imaging with HRCT, and this is a picture of a UIP pattern. And then of course, lung function showing a typical restrictive uh, physiology with reduction in lung volumes and transfer factor. And then where required, bronchialveolar lavage with or without a biopsy looking for lymphocytosis, or in this case, in this transbronchial biopsy, non-caseating granulomas, 
or in this case, in the VATS biopsy, a UIP pattern. And obviously, the gold standard of diagnosis of interstitial lung disease is in multidisciplinary team diagnosis, where we comprehensively evaluate the clinical assessments, lung function, CT, and where appropriate lavage and biopsy to make a definitive diagnosis, a working diagnosis, or indeed 20% um, of unclassifiable diagnoses. I just wanted to highlight this uh, ABCD approach that Miley's Weisbeck has published. I like simple things, and this is a lovely simple mnemonic for management of interstitial lung disease. A for assess, assessing the patient's needs and the caregiver's needs, backing that up with support groups and patient advocacy groups and stopping smoking, thinking about comorbidities, because obviously our patients are elderly and have a number of comorbidities, as well as comfort care, which is a nice term for palliative care but or supportive care disease modifying therapies, whether it's antifibrotics or immunosuppressants, but also thinking about timely discussion of end of life care, particularly when we're thinking about diseases like idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So this is my first typical case of a patient who is um, hitting 70 years old, diagnosed in primary care with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, but presents with progressive breathlessness over six months and a dry cough. And he's a ex-smoker with a previous history of ischemic heart disease and MI five years ago. And as just, this is just to illustrate that patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis have a delay in diagnosis because often common things are common. The primary care physicians will treat them with the commonest diagnosis, which is COPD. Patients are smoker than who's breathless. So obviously it's COPD and are given inhalers, but there's poor response to inhalers. Patient goes back to the primary care physician and they hear crackles and think, oh, well, there's a history of MI, so maybe this is heart failure. So 18 months later, the patient is also being treated with inhalers and frusamide for heart failure with no symptomatic improvement. There's no exposures um, such as asbestos and there's no um, symptoms or signs of connective tissue disease. The patient, when you see them, is hypoxic and they've got nail clubbing, which is loss of the angle between the nail and the uh, nail bed, which we get in 25 to 50% of patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And they have that classical bibasal Velcro-like crepitations and no features of connective tissue disease. So this is the HLCT for this patient in 2012. Uh, just a few slices and you can appreciate there is some reticulation um, um, with some probably traction bronchiolexis. And as you go down, is this honeycombing? It's difficult to say because there's not more than one. Um, uh, there's no stacks of cysts, uh, but this would probably um, get a probable UIP pattern. So at this time, this patient had mild changes on the scan and the patient's force vital capacity is 100% with a transfer factor of 59% and they were given an MDT diagnosis of probable or definite usual interstitial pneumonia pattern consistent with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis because there's no other uh, potential causes. Now, I just wanted to highlight, this is very specific to the UK and obviously not relevant to Sri Lanka, but this is just to illustrate the point of the other things we should think about in IPF. In the UK, we have a, a National Institute of Health and Clinical Excellence, denoted NICE, uh, or how I call them, not so nice. And they um, do a cost-effective analysis of treatments. And the NICE criteria in the UK tells us that we can't treat patients whose FVC is above 80%. So we have specific FVC criteria. So this gentleman's FVC was above the criteria for treatment on a cost perspective. So the NICE have also um, developed some quality standards and their quality standards say that we should have an MDT diagnosis. So we tick that. And just importantly, it's important to remember to um, uh, refer these patients for pulmonary rehab, ambulatory oxygen assessments. They must see a specialist nurse for education advice, and we should assess the palliative care needs or the supportive care needs for the patient. So what's the evidence for pulmonary rehab? I didn't want to do a talk on just medication and forget all the other treatments. So NICE recommend pulmonary rehab, and there's multiple studies demonstrating the benefit of pulmonary rehab. In fact, 
Pulmonary rehab is the only treatment that helps the patient's quality of life. None of our antifibrotics have shown any quality of life in, uh, improvement. They're very variable. You can have six to 12 week programs comprising um, combinations of education, exercise, psychological support. And there's about 12 randomized controlled trials and there's been a Cochrane re review. But one of the problems with pulmonary rehab is that you, it, there's a lot of bias. So it's low quality data because it's usually small numbers. You obviously can't blind a patient to pulmonary rehab because they either get it or they don't. And a lot of the studies don't have any control groups. But what they do show is that there's an improvement in the six minute walk test and an improvement in the quality of life for these patients. And these are just a few papers that I've just highlighted. There are many just to demonstrate the improvement in the quality of life as measured by various uh, questionnaires, uh, St. George's respiratory questionnaire and the statistical improvements in the quality of life. There's loads of questions that remain about pulmonary rehab, for example, the duration of treatment, the types of training you should give, whether it's endurance or muscle strength, and how we sustain benefits as well. And not forgetting ambulatory oxygen, so our nice quality standards say that we should refer our patients for ambulatory oxygen for interstitial lung disease. And there's very little data, but Elizabeth Renzoni from the Brompton in the UK has recently published the AMBOX study. So this is a randomized controlled trial of ambulatory oxygen. It's a crossover trial where patients with interstitial lung diseases, not just IPF, got oxygen for two weeks and then a cylinder with no oxygen um, and they had a crossover so they were their own controls and various measurements particularly including um, quality of life measures um, and there were approximately almost 100 patients 84 patients randomized into the study and basically what the study showed is not surprisingly patients with ambulatory oxygen were had a statistically significant improvement in their breathlessness scores their Borg scores, and in particular, they had improvements in their quality of life, uh, looking at their breathlessness domains, chest symptom domains, but not the psychological domains. So first randomized controlled trial of ambulatory oxygen. So going back to our case, uh, this patient was stable for 18 months, but then presented with progressive breathlessness over six months with increased cough and two respiratory tract infections. And if you can remember the original CT, this patient now has a definite UIP pattern with evidence of progression with this stats of honeycombing. Um, and he shows now his lung function, his FVC was 100% and it's now 67%. The transfer factor, I, I think, was in its 69% and it's now 46%. So now he meets the NICE criteria for antifibrotics. So he was counseled for nintedanib or perfenidone. And so what's the evidence for antifibrotics? Now, you, I don't think you can talk about the current evidence without remembering the past so the past treatment for IPF was steroids. And this was based on this very small study by Raghu, the king of IPF, as I call him. I've met him and I've told him I call him the king of IPF. Very small study of patients with cryptogenic fibrosing alveolitis. So in the era where we lumped everything together, whether it was a young patient with NSIP or an elderly man with IPF, they were all lumped together. And this study showed that if you're on azathioprine and prednisolone, your probability of surviving was much better than prednisolone alone. And so the past was that we pumped these patients with steroids until we did a proper randomized controlled trial, the Pan Panther IPF study that showed that patients with azathioprine and prednisolone and n cysteine combination therapy actually were more likely to die or more likely to be hospitalized. And actually that we were doing harm to our patients with IPF by giving them immunosuppression. So current treatments, so we have three randomized control trials for phenidone capacity and ASCEND and the Japanese Shinogi studies, and obviously impulsus for nintedanib, which is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And they've all been shown to slow the rate of decline in IPF and also improve survival. And also actually now for perfenidone and nintedanib in the post hoc analyses for nintedanib. And I think you've seen these slides before. So this is just the headline graphs showing with um, 
uh, ascend, that perfenidone reduces the decline in FVC and similarly for nintedonib. And, and including um, the mortality benefit. So one of the things about these drugs is that they do have side effects um, on the left for perfenidone and the right in the impulsive study. Uh, but the side effects are very manageable by the way you take the, uh, the drug, ensuring that um, particularly for perfenidone, when you're, when you're on three tablets three times a day, making sure you split the tablet across your meal, don't take them all at once. Um, uh, but the side effects tend to be gastrointestinal with nausea, anorexia, and loss of weight. And similarly with nintedonib, they tend to be gastrointestinal with diarrhea and loose stool be the commonest. But again, all these are manageable by using loperamide to try and prevent uh, loose stools. And we've got a wealth of data now with loads of post-hoc analyses, both for phenidone and nintedonib, showing no matter how you look at the data, whether you split the USA to the rest of the world, whether you're young or old, male, female, whether your FVC is low or high, whether you're a smoker or non-smoker, you always uh, favour the antifibrotic, perfenidone here, and then similarly always favour nintedonib, no matter how you split the data. So that's the evidence for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So um, we're going on to the next case. So this, these are real cases, by the way, that I've seen in clinic. This is a 38 year old lady who presents with a two year history of daily cough and progressive breathlessness. Her exercise tolerance is only 100 meters. She's lost weight, she's got reflux, she's feeling dizzy when she walks. She's an ex-smoker and actually I, I was lucky that she'd actually recently seen a rheumatologist and was recently diagnosed as having systemic sclerosis and the rheumatologist has started her on prednisolone. She'd also had a recent onset of two year history of Raynaud's and a year history of swollen sore joints in her hands, puffiness and she, she was a corporate banker. She had, this isn't pictures of her, I just took these off the internet, that she had the typical features of stomach sclerosis with tightness in her skin, telangiectasia, tightness around her mouth, this puckering sign and periungal erythema, and this just showing uh, Raynaud's as well. And uh, this is in limited cutaneous systemic sclerosis, we call this crest with calcinosis, Raynaud's, esophageal dysmotility, sclerodactyly and telangiectasia. This is her lung function, which was shocking really. Although her lung spirometry was within the normal range or low normal, her transfer factor was very low at 23% with a KCO of 45% and she was SCL 70 positive. This is a CT in August 2017, and you will be able to appreciate that she has this fine reticulation and ground glass predominantly subpleural, gets worse at the bases uh, with possibly some traction bronchiectasis or traction bronchiolectasis, but predominantly ground glass and fine reticulation. And I'm showing you the mediastinal windows because I mentioned dizziness on exertion and the radiologist did say that maybe the pulmonary artery was a little bit bigger than the aorta and they commented that this, the septum was, wasn't as bowed as it should be. So the septum should be bowed into the right ventricle because of the pressure on the left, but it was quite straight. So they wondered whether she also had pulmonary hypertension. And this is eight months later, her CT. You'll be able to appreciate that she's now become very fibrotic with traction bronchiectasis. The ground glass has now become very fibrotic and she's got a fibrotic NSIP pattern with progressive fibrotic pattern in the context of systemic sclerosis. So she has a connective tissue disease related interstitial lung disease. And she also had an echocardiogram which showed uh, pulmonary hypertension with a systolic pulmonary uh, artery pressure of 45 to 50 but good RV function. So what's the incidence of interstitial lung disease in systemic sclerosis? Well, there's a high prevalence of subclinical disease. In old autopsy studies, almost 70% of patients with systemic sclerosis have ILD. So we don't treat everybody, but we treat those with clinically significant disease, so maybe more than 30%, but those with risk factors for severe fibrosis. So if you present with your interstitial lung disease at your diagnosis for systemic sclerosis, you are more likely to decline. So the kind of patient that you wouldn't think about treating is somebody who was diagnosed with systemic sclerosis eight years ago, 
and somebody's do, uh, they complained of a cough and they had a CT done which shows maybe 15 to 20% fibrosis and you may not think of treating those patients because they are now eight years beyond their diagnosis systemic sclerosis. The people that are going to progress are those who um, have their ILD within the first five years of their systemic sclerosis, more likely in the diffuse scleroderma, high, higher in those with SCL 70, smokers, male, and then higher in the African population as well. Um, and this is just to illustrate the U style data where they looked at patients with limited systemic sclerosis and diffuse. Um, and just re to remind you, limited is when they have a skin involvement below the elbows, whereas diffuse is where their chest has skin involvement. And this just shows you the prevalence of interstitial lung disease in the U-star cohort and the Norwegian cohort as well. So who we, do we treat? So this is the Brompton algorithm. Um, they uh, suggest that we risk stratify patients according to the extent of fibrosis. If you have less than 20% fibrosis, this would be limited disease that you may not treat. If you have indeterminate or more than 20% fibrosis with a reduction in FVC, you have extensive disease. And the reason this is important is it affects your mortality. So those with extensive disease have worse survival than those with limited disease. So practically, who do we treat? We would treat somebody within the first five years of their diagnosis with reduced FVC. Um, this lady didn't have an FVC below, below 70 but she definitely had significant fibrosis with progression on her HRCT. So what do we treat them with? So this is a scleroderma lung studies one and two. Scleroderma lung study one was a randomized control trial of oral cyclophosphamide versus two true placebo. And cyclophosphamide showed an improvement in your FVC, very modest improvement with only 2.5% improvement, but better outcomes if you had more severe fibrosis and but cyclophosphamide as you all know has a number a lot of side effects and so the same they did the same group did the scleroderma lung study too where they come did a head-to-head -head comparison of mycophenolate with cyclophosphamide uh, in over 140 patients and they found this was a non-inferiority study they found no difference between mycophenolate or cyclophosphamide. And so mycophenolate seemed as effective at six months than cyclophosphamide. But one of the biggest advantages is that mycophenolate is much better tolerated. They got less patients stopping the treatment and less leukopenia and thrombocytopenia as well. So the current kind of mainstay of treatment for immunosuppression really first line would be mycophenolate. So how did we treat this lady? Well. I think the key, key thing is to be cautious with high dose steroids because this can precipitate renal crisis. We started this lady on low dose prednisolone plus mycophenolate as first line. And we also, um, because we wanted a quick response and she had such severe fibrosis, then you could consider pulse methyled um, cyclophosphamide because it will work faster than mycophenolate. And then you could think about um, the role of rituximab. Now, there are no randomized controlled trials for rituximab as yet for systemic sclerosis. Um, all the studies are just open label studies, uh, small studies that do show some benefit um, uh, with rituximab in their lung function and skin scores. So for this lady, we discussed mycophenolate versus cyclophosphamide versus going into a clinical trial. At the time, we were recruiting into Recital, which is a clinical trial of rituximab versus cyclophosphamide. Um, she was referred to the pulmonary vascular disease unit and was started on sildenafil, and she, was, um, she opted to go into the randomized control trial of rituximab versus IV cyclophosphamide. And this is just my only pathology slide, just to highlight that the pathophysiology of scleroderma is felt to be very similar to that with IPF, and thus illustrates the rationale for the census study of nintedinib, a randomized control trial of nintedinib in patients with systemic sclerosis, which I'll go through, um, through next. Uh, so the census study is, um, the criteria for inclusion were patients with systemic sclerosis who had a disease onset of less than seven years. They had to have less than, uh, greater than 10% fibrosis, FVC above 40%, and they had to be stable on treatment 
with methotrexate or mycophenolate for at least six months and they were randomized to placebo on intedinib. And you can see that the uh, average age was 54, predominantly female. And nicely, there was a mixture of diffuse and limited disease. Um, and at least half of the patients were also on mycophenolate. And you can see the stop rates, um, as we'd ex expect, less stopping with placebo than nintedinib. But basically, the primary endpoint showed that with nintedinib, there was a reduction in decline in FVC, where the patients declined by 93 mils a year in placebo, but only by 52 mils um, in nintedinib. So this was statistically significant. And the incidence of diarrhea and GI symptoms, as expected, was higher with nintedinib. Um, and, but there was no change in quality of life or skin scores. And this is just pictorially, just showing you very similar to the IPF studies that there was a reduction in decline in FVC with nintedinib versus placebo. And just to highlight that, um, although we're never really supposed to extrapolate, um, you can see that if you had no mycophenolate on placebo, you were declining by 119 mils per year. If you're on mycophenolate and placebo, mycophenolate seems to obviously do something. The decline is much less, uh, but then with nintedinib, there's an added effect. So very quickly, um, I'm going to very quickly go over progressive ILD. You've already heard about the inbuilt study. So just to highlight, obviously, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is the archetypal progressive ILD, but all the other interstitial lung disease do have a propensity to progress. And so the inbuilt trial was a randomized controlled trial of nintedinib in progressive fibrotic interstitial lung disease that were not idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. But to get into this trial, you had to have progression over 24 months. And this was defined by either an FVC decline of more than 10%, a relative decline of 5% to 10% plus worsening symptoms or increased fibrosis on the CT, or you could just have worsening symptoms and fibrosis on your CT without the lung function decline. And patients were randomized to receive nintedinib over 300 or placebo. And, and similarly, just to highlight, this was highlighted to, to us in, uh, by one of the previous speakers. This just shows you the types of diseases that were um, in the trial. 20% had an idiopathic NSIP, a quarter were chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, 14% rheumatoid, 6% systemic sclerosis, and 18% unclassifiable. So a really nice study where we lumped all these diseases together. And basically, they showed a reduction in the decline in FVC um, with nintedinib versus placebo. And similarly, similar effects with regards to adverse effects. Um, so I, sorry, I'll just skip those. And then this is just the same graph that you've seen before, showing a reduction in decline in FVC with nintedinib in the overall population, as well as the UIP population. They did have enriched for UIP in this trial, and 60% of the patients had a UIP pattern. So what's the future for fibrosing interstitial lung diseases? Hopefully, I've shown you that an MDT diagnosis is key because we really want to identify those diseases where there's an underlying cause so that we can remove the possible cause or even treat the underlying cause and achieve some response or stability with immunosuppression. However, if disease progresses, then we really should be thinking about antifibrotics, lung transplants, and supportive care as well as managing disease complications. So hopefully I've given you a very quick overview of the evidence base between the, around the holistic management of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, systemic sclerosis and the additional roles of antifibrotics. And we can have a discussion about that because some of you may have noticed that the additional benefit is very modest. And then uh, the evidence behind intedinib in progressive interstitial lung disease. And thank you uh, for listening. And so my final slides, I mean, just watch this space. There are over 100 
clinical trials going on at the moment in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis with nebulized pifenidone and various other nebulized and oral therapies that I think in the next five to 10 years uh, will come to fruition. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Chaudhary. It's very comprehensive, the management of interstitial lung disease with the current evidence. And you touch upon according to the clinical scenarios with uh, the cases and use the current knowledge to how to manage these patients. Thank you very much on behalf of the organizers. Now we have come to the end of the four presentation. Now we will open up the question time and the questions will be directed to the uh, presenters. We received some questions from our listeners and I'm inviting Dr. Nandik Harishchandra to start uh, the questions. Right. Once again, thank you very much uh, for the, all the presenters. Uh, based on the time, actually, we can entertain only four questions from each speaker. The first question actually goes to uh, Professor Asuma. Uh, what type of birds and antigens causes hypersensitivity in pneumonitis? Beg your pardon? Uh, uh, what, what are the booths? What sort of birds and antigens? Causes hypersensitivity uh, in pneumonitis. Antigen, uh, bird related antigen is, uh, uh, Dr. Miyazaki I, uh, identified uh, one of the fungus, uh, including the pigeon drop. Uh, so, uh, uh, many other things, uh, uh, I don't know the uh, first kind of species of fungus. Uh, uh, one of the uh, candidate of, of uh, fungus, uh, including the pigeon drop. So uh, th this is very difficult to culture. So. Uh, Genetic sequence is not identified yet. One of the uh, fung fungus species. It's okay, uh, and not nothing incomplete, but but uh, future research is will be needed. Yeah. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you, Professor Zuma. The second question we we should. Uh, uh, how do you make the decision of MMF for fibrosing ILD? What is the place of bar, bronchial lavage, lymphocytosis? This question is leading to uh, Dr. Chaudhary. Thank you very much. Um, so there is um, randomized control trial evidence for use of mycophenolate, as I mentioned, in systemic sclerosis, as well as um, small RCTs um, for chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis as well. Um, so the role of BAL, I think BAL is very valuable in the non-IPF interstitial lung diseases uh, because a good quality BAL that shows uh, a lymphocytosis um, greater than 30%, uh, and we can debate the percentage, is really helpful when you're directing immunosuppression, particularly when you're dealing with an older cohort of patients. So it might be a patient who's a bit elderly with diabetes, and you're, you don't really want to throw very high dose steroids at them. So the BAL lymphocytosis, particularly in, in HP, is helpful. Although we know that in chronic HP, um, the, you know, there's a false negative rate. There's a very high false reg ne negative rate in chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So often the, the, the BAL lymphocytosis is, is, is low, uh, but certainly in acute causes, in drug-induced causes and idiopathic NSIP, it's very helpful. Um, and mycophenolate would be first line for me in any non-idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis when we think about second line immunosuppression. Mycophenolate or azathioprine, there's plenty of evidence of um, azathioprine and methotrexate in sarcoid as well. But generally, I do find mycophenolate is much better tolerated than azathioprine, just anecdotally uh, from a side effect potential. Thank you very much, Dr. Okay. Uh, just uh, next question goes to. Uh, okay. 
Professor uh, Dr. Chankaria. Uh, could you get an elaboration on the use of minimum intensity projections in ILTs? Um, I'm actually getting muted by the host anyway. Um, so we use minimum intensity um, projections when it's subtle disease. So we, we're doing a lot of that with the early COVID-19 perivascular ground glass. It's always much better appreciated uh, with minimum IP. These are usually three millimeter uh, minimum IP projections. But we don't really use them um, as a tool for, let's say, diagnosis or classification of ILDs. That's that's not what it's for. It's really just for early pickup, sometimes of picking up honeycombing when it's very subtle, picking up early ground glass, etc. Question uh, to Dr. Amit Fernando, uh, in related to in acute exacerbation of uh, CTD ILD, how do we select the second immunosuppressive drug, cyclophosphamide, rituximab, Tractolima, Cyclosporin A, or MMF? Question lead to Dr. Amit Fernando. Actually, I'm the one who asked that question. Yeah. Uh, and I would like uh, Dr. Chowdhury to share her experiences because I mean, we, I couldn't find any data uh, relevant to this. Uh, we tend to uh, use cyclophosphamide when the patient has cystic sclerosis or uh, a more uh, pulmonary hypertension associated with it or a vascular element to it. Um, we tend to uh, use um, the, the other second, we have little experience, as I said in my talk, about taplodimus uh, in uh, patients and cyclosporin A. We do uh, use um, rituximab in patients with RA-related interstitial lung disease. So I would like Dr. Chowdhury to kindly comment on her experience with cyclosporin A, taplodimus, uh, to share her experience with us um, in acute so exacerbations of ILD or so CTILDs. In acute exacerbation, as you've alluded to, there's, there's, there's very little randomized control trial evidence of any of the immunosuppressions because they're such a really difficult group to, um, to be in clinical trials. I know the Japanese have had a number of clinical trials. So um, there was a, a large questionnaire published recently of experts in ILD asking them about their treatment of acute exacerbation of IP, um, interstitial lung diseases um, and, and there was a great variation in treatment strategies from using uh, IV methylprednisolone to IV cyclophosphamide uh, using rituximab um, and other therapies like polymyxin B. So there isn't any gold standard at all. And it's a question that's really difficult to answer, unfortunately, because the evidence isn't there. Yeah, once again, the, the behalf of the Candy Society of Medicine and Sri Lanka College of Palmer, I must take it as a privilege and the thanks to all of you, all the resource person, Professor Asuma, Dr. Chaudhary, Dr. Jankaria, Dr. Amit Fernando, being a resource person today, the webinar uh, organized by these two societies, joint effort. And I think the, 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 we had a very, very well organized and a resource rich evidence-based approach to the management of interstitial lung disease and the different aspects. Now I'm inviting Dr. Afla Sadiqin uh, to final conclude the session and summarizing the, the today presentations. Thank you very much. I think uh, we have reached uh, the end of a successful and enlightening session carried out by four experts who have shared their valuable knowledge with, in, in this uh, virtual session. So the speaker's discussion and their wisdom on interstitial lung disease has made us a lot to think about in this uh, uh, challenge field. Uh, especially as respiratory physician, we see uh, connective tissue disease, interstitial lung disease, as one of the entities, we have some armory with us uh, to treat them. However, we also heard how challenging it could be, especially uh, after listening to Dr. Amita Fernando uh, in those acute presentation. However, uh, we, we realized that uh, some of those cases, especially uh, with known or features of uh, uh, connective tissue disease presenting with uh, hypoxia and respiratory symptoms, uh, basically in a critical presentation, uh, could be ever challenging when there is underlying infection or uh, some other 
uh, confounding factor like uh, pulmonary embolism uh, come into play. However, uh, I, though we don't have much evidence in terms of uh, acute presentation or uh, acute management of uh, uh, critical presentation of connective tissue disease, uh, we, it is quite important to detect early as possible uh, to uh, give them the relief. So Dr. Amita Fernandu is one of our senior consultant respiratory physician in Colombo, has been with the College of Pulmonologists as one of the eminent speakers. And thank you very much for taking your time off from your busy schedule and to be with us to share your experience. And uh, my uh, thanks goes to Dr. Arata Azuma, who is a professor of pulmonary medicine in Tokyo, Japan, who brought up some important and thought provoking uh, points on hypersensitive pneumonitis. He, he brought up this genetic determination and prognostic uh, markers, including uh, if we see when we treat um, hypersensitive pneumonitis patients. And also he wanted us uh, to uh, think of uh, differentiating this acute type and chronic type uh, in regard to the chemokine type and also uh, on the radiologic setting. And also uh, he touched upon the treatment option, um, that is the immunosuppressions, including steroids and MMF. However, the, the new trial on internally as one of the uh, options we have in the future. And uh, there is near, uh, clear evidence we have that now use of new internally in chronic HV as well. So uh, thank you, uh, Professor Azuma. Uh, for your contribution, and uh, uh, we hope to see you. Uh, very, uh, hope to see you in Sri Lanka as well. Dr. Bavin Jankaria, consultant radiologist, uh, who is not a stranger for us, and uh, he's uh, he has been with us many times, and he has shared his uh, expert knowledge on uh, HRCT through the eyes of radiologists. Having said that, respiratory physicians need to have a very good knowledge on high resolution CT scan, especially when it comes for a better management outcome on the clinical aspect. So today we uh, heard a fantastic, very clear message on differentiating fibrotic and non-fibrotic ILD on the HRC perspective. And it is important to assess the volume scans uh, for proper interpretation and also the way we differentiate the fibrotic and non-fibrotic HRC, uh, fibrotic um, uh, findings on the HRTC films. He gave us a, a clear presentation of uh, differentiating UIP from the fibrotic, other fibrotic ILD as well. I was really fascinated and I'm very thankful for the information he brought us on post-COVID changes and we are going to see more and more in the future, especially the change of, of this ground glass or organizing pneumonia pattern later into uh, those non-specific areas going into ground glass pattern. And also he was quite um, happy to share his experience of his uh, uh, COVID related changes. Especially, I was, I'm, I was really happy to see the uh, peribronchial vascular changes involving the uh, vascular uh, uh, treen bud appearance in the HRCT. Dr. Nazia Chaudhry, clinical lead in ILD and consultant respiratory physician from United Kingdom was fantastic on elaborating the treatment strategies in ILD. And uh, Dr. Nazia, a big thank you for accepting my invitation in a short notice to share your experience with us. And uh, he, your, your approach uh, to ILD management was simply, uh, it, it's, a, it's a very important message to us. It's not all about drugs and drugs because uh, you, 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 are, you mentioned about your, uh, the, the, the current evidence about on pulmonary habilitation and ambulatory oxygen. I think the highlighting the current evidence on those um, areas will enlighten us of managing, managing patients in uh, interstitial lung disease. And also, I'm uh, very thankful to you bringing up the evidence management and the, uh, on IPF and uh, CTIDB, especially uh, mentioning on the census trial study uh, on an internally. So I'm uh, looking forward to see you and your presence in Sri Lanka. And I'm uh, hoping to uh, have your contribution to Sri Lanka College of Pulmonologists in the future, especially in the field of ILD and your experience and your uh, expert knowledge on ILD with the ERS and BTS.
So I'm pleased to hear from you, especially I, 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 I like to uh, um, remember your time, my time in UK with you, working with you. Thank you very much. We hope to see you in Sri Lanka soon. So Dr. Yes. Dushanta Madhagara, you are the pillar of Sri Lankan College of Physicians. You are, thank you for being the moderator of this session and for your fantastic introduction on interstitial lung disease. And also, thank you very much for, your, for you guiding us, making uh, this uh, a great success. Dr. Nandika Harishchandra, the president of Sri Lanka College of Physicians, thank you for moderating this event and also allowing us to listen to some of those eminent speakers from uh, the world that come here and uh, give their expert knowledge. So I would like to thank the sponsors, Boringer, and our event management coordinator, Mr. Nalin, and his team for your valuable support and the coordination. At last, but not the least, it is who you made this webinar successful. So thank you for our audience. And I'm sure all of you all have learned something very valuable today for your clinical practice in the future. Thank you very much. So I would like to conclude our session now. Thank you very much.